Hello and welcome to Dinesh Warda YouTube podcast series here in partnership with openbusinesscouncil.org, citiesabc.com and fashionabc.org. So the world of technology is going through a massive revolution and there's fantastic things happening and a lot of challenges as well, like in anything that is about technology and innovation. But one of the things that we always privilege here on this series is the people that are making a change, the people that are keeping on creating solutions for humanity. And uh, of course, uh, one of my passions, as everyone knows in my channel, is blockchain, how these technologies can be used to improve uh, our society, our identity, and a lot of different things that it comes to the fourth industrial revolution that we are going through. And one of the biggest challenges definitely is how we're going to be using these technologies to improve, but as well to create case studies that can actually leapfrog humanity and society. So in our series, we've been profiling all these the personalities behind the projects. And uh, today we are very uh, privileged to have here with us uh, Liz Matthew, the head of growth and partnerships at MetaMask Institutional. And uh, I think the... Of course, everyone in blockchain knows what is MetaMask, and they're going to be highlighting uh, this project in particular. So before I go to Liz, uh, just for everyone knows, MetaMask is one of the biggest uh, um, platforms in the world. It's a software cryptocurrency wallet used to interact with the Ethereum blockchain, and it allows users to access their Ethereum wallet through browser extension or mobile app, which can then be used to interact with the centralized applications. And at the moment, is one of the biggest ecosystems of wallets in the world and has been growing. And partly of the revolution of the NFTs is partly coming from MetaMask and the, all the possibilities that came out of that. But as well, there's a huge pipeline of institutional things that are going to be talking. So I just want to start with this preamble. Now, let's go to Liz. So Liz uh, um, Matthew or Elizabeth Matthew is an experienced capital markets and technology executive. She's a Web 3.0 builder and an entrepreneur. And uh, at the moment, she's the head of growth and partnership division of MetaMask Institutional, building on a business strategy for blockchain and Web 3.0. In terms of education, Elizabeth uh, holds a double master of business administration in entrepreneurship from the Columbia Business School and in finance, economics and general management from Indian Institute of Management of uh, Ahmedabad. Ahmedab. Ahmedab. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. So with an international exposure of working with big international corporations and brands like Deutsche Bank, Lehman Brothers and JP Morgan, uh, Liz uh, is an experience in financial strategies like fixed income sales, trading and structuring. And of course, there's a fantastic experience on finance and technology, which brings us from a career in some of the biggest platforms in the world. She is an entrepreneur as well that established VisiNow in March 2018 and also wrote for a consulting service for organizations like Smart VisX, an early stage VR AR solutions provider for the GCC region in the architecture, real estate and construction space, where she was responsible for business development and market research. And she also uh, worked on securitize and consensus in executive positions. A certified blockchain architect uh, from Blockchain Council, she was focused focus her acumen towards decentralized finance, DeFi, and Web 3.0. And she has, contribu has contributed for various publications, including Altcoin Magazine, Tab Forum, and Journal of Securities Operations and Custody. And she's as well an author that she was involved in creating tokenization, assembling the building blocks of an institutional digital asset marketplace, for the Journal of Securities, Operations and Custody, where she shared their thoughts on the transformation in the way business to business, B2B, consensus is established in traditional capital markets. So I could go for more. She's as well a mentor, but that's fantastic achievement. And welcome to our series, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, so you have a fantastic profile, which is quite amazing, especially for a, a woman in finance, because you touch hardcore technology hardcore trading and investment, and now hardcore investment, and as well, all the innovation around blockchain. So let's start with your background, because uh, I, I love actually to profile um, entrepreneurs and, and doers like you, but you have a fantastic, very different part, because you have like from extreme hardcore finance of Wall Street, 
to innovation hardcore from MetaMask, blockchain, and crypto. So can you tell us a bit about background and how do you get to, to this fantastic uh, uh, position you are now? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a quite a natural progression. Um, so I'm um, an engineer by training, but uh, really um, my core competence is commercializing ideas. Um, I think of myself as a lifelong student of capital markets. Um, one of the reasons why I in, you know, joined financial markets was because I was influenced by my dad, who's an economist, and um, I find it fascinating how you can have systems that enable the free flow of capital and credit between demand and supply. And so um, blockchain technology um, is by its very nature an extension of existing um, infrastructure systems that enable uh, the free flow of data uh, and capital. Um, and so I, I think it's a very natural progression for someone who's been in capital markets and various capacities to be able to look at this technology as the next frontier in how we get more efficient at, 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 at doing that, you know, uh, not, not to pigeonhole blockchain technology specifically to capital markets, but was probably the reason why I uh, looked at the space. So let's talk a bit about your education and as well uh, your career, because I always like to start with the basis. And you mentioned your father, so I'm sure he has an impact in your education and as well in your career. Yeah, so uh, born and raised in India, in, in Bombay and Delhi. Um, I'm an engineer by training and uh, quickly moved on to um, sort of business studies. And throughout my career, I have sort of found myself in situations where I'm um, responsible for a zero to one process, be it within um, you know, a, a traditional capital market sales and trading uh, desk, starting a new business line um, to, to where I find myself right now, which is um, again, going from a concept uh, two years ago where the market you know, basically reached out to us and said, you have the MetaMask retail wallet, that's great. However, it's not fit for purpose for institutional requirements and thus created um, this new business line within consensus to solve for organizational access to Web3. And that can look very different depending upon the kind of organization you are. So um, so yeah, I, you know, I, th I think it's just a continuation of doing what I've done um, throughout my career of of, of thinking about keenly how do you commercialize and grow um, from an idea to sustainable business line. And that's actually the most important thing is how you make that trajectory, especially as technology keep evolving. So you talk, you touch a lot of different things. So the blockchain um, part of the work, and of course uh, it's key on MetaMask, but before we go to, to MetaMask, I would like to, so, as someone that has been on the community of finance and then moving to the community of blockchain, which of course is the same in a lot of ways, how do you see the, the challenge from corporate finance to more innovative uh, finance, fintech and the blockchain revolution we're going through? Yeah, it's it's super interesting. So um, it's, uh, yeah, so in sales and trading, um, the, the kind of business and revenue generated is almost well it depends it can depend on which division you are within um the investment bank but can sometimes really just be a function of the relationships the franchise and ultimately the balance sheet uh the specific trade ideas that you convey to the market can be ephemeral so it's almost a services related offering and the emphasis, at least in the in the um, in the business lines that I've been focused on setting up prior, um, you aren't thinking about how do I hundred x this, how do I build a repeatable, sustainable, scalable growth machine? It's almost a um, capturing of market um, sort of uh, you know the, the market dynamics as is 
that year almost. You, you almost look at it on a yearly basis. Um, that's not to say that there aren't divisions within investment banks that do keenly think about um, a tech-led growth uh, momentum. Uh, there certainly are. But when you think about the traditional sales and trading, structuring um, businesses, it's almost a services style um, offering. Whereas what I find myself today looking at growth for MetaMask Institutional, um, as we think about building for our earliest adopters, you know, the institutions that are showing up today that are building um, companies around how they um, earn a return in Web3 or how do they engage with their communities using Web3 technology, um, you know, how do we solve for the those users? And then how do we then take those learnings and solve for um, the majority, the late majority? And that's a fundamentally different approach to how we think about growth, uh, selling and customer engagement. So I, I find it, I mean, it's, it probably works um, across the same ways, across various different technical verticals. But when we are building, uh, we are thinking about how are we building for a repeatable, scalable um, growth machine. It's it's almost less about influencing a customer. It's it's more about understanding um, where the customer is at, and if we build something, would there be appetite for the customer to access this in the absence of a human being trying to convince them to buy it? So it's it's a very different mindset. I think of capital markets as somewhat of a push growth model versus tech sales to be somewhat of a pull uh, growth motion, if that makes sense. Uh, I love the way you put it. Um, so so that brings me to my next question. So uh, if you look at MetaMask, it's precisely in the central leverage between that, because in one end is a global community of developers and designers that is dedicated to making the world a better place with blockchain technology, but as well a mission is to democratize access, access to the decentralized web that we've been talking about, and as well intends to transform the world economy to empower individuals through interactions based on consent, privacy, and free association. And in terms of the history in 2021, uh, the decentralized finance ecosystem grew by 20 times, and of course this year has been in a, probably in a adaptation, but it has attracted uh, hundreds of millions of users. At the moment, there's 350 million, more or less, people in, in blockchain crypto wallets. And a huge part of them are MetaMask driven. And as well, the the part of uh, the MetaMask Institutional, MMI, was created in December 2020 by consensus to address large numbers of leading crypto funds, market makers, and trading desks seeking to increase exposure to DeFi and to alternative blockchain solutions. So can you tell us about that history and how it positions right now the MetaMask institutional that you are leading? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, um, like like you mentioned, MetaMask institutional was uh, set up to solve for the unique operational requirements that organizations um, have to deal with, quite different to how an individual um would access Web3. And so it has some of the features and functionalities that go towards a organization's requirement to think about governance at the team level or business division level. It uh, enables the ability to think about the segregation of roles and responsibilities between individuals that are collectively managing um, a Web3 token portfolio. And when you think about an organization that is accessing Web3, if you put them, I, I, I like to think of them as, um, even though our not star goal is to uh, bridge every organization on the planet to Web3, um, one could find ourselves boiling the ocean if we didn't know where to start, right? So taking a step back and say, how do we break this down? We think of um, customer segments as primarily two kinds. One being the kind of 
uh, organization whose primary business purpose is to interact with Web3. And this could be fungible or non-fungible tokens. And so the user of MetaMask Institutional is, um, is, is a very active user on the platform. Their, their, their business heavily relies on their ability to interact with the pl platform in order to do what they need to do in Web3. Um, the second bucket of users are, it, you know, it's not their primary focus to interact with Web3, but it just so happens that they find themselves as an organization having exposure to tokens um, and, and collectively, how can they responsibly manage that? Um, and so if we took, take those two segments, um, you will find that both segments require a certain level of um, reporting and monitoring capabilities. They require a certain amount of governance policies that need to be maintained within the, the teams. Um, the way they think about um, pre-trade price discovery or post-trade monitoring has similarities um, and are quite um, different to how an individual might interact with Web3. And so that was sort of the primary reason for us to take a step back and say, well, organizations are using the retail wallet. However, we need to be able to solve for certain features and functionalities around custody, um, governance policies, reporting and monitoring. And that's the primary reason why MetaMask Institutional was created. We launched in um in in late 2021 so it's been a year now almost um since we've been live and yes we we've, we've been rapidly growing since launch so let, let's look at case studies so um of course metamask has been fast growing is one of the biggest wallets in the planet um and of course you are responsible institutions so business to business institutions is there any case studies you want to highlight for our audience? Something that you want? I know that there's a lot of news um, that you guys have been taking, but something more specific or one or two. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, see, the month of November with, you know, all the sort of market volatility seen in um, sort of access to assets in in the in the most direct way possible nuances and differences in how you manage your assets in web3 um we are a centralized intermediary we are a third party custodian or exchange um or natively uh using a web3 wallet such as metamask uh, or metamask institutional has become a um specific for area of of discussion among customers. And I think the key thing to highlight here is, um, you know, we absolutely want to encourage customers to be able to hold their assets themselves. Um, that's, that's really what Web3 is about. It's about empowerment and having control of your assets, of your data and, and content. Um, when you think about that from the lens of an institution, how can we solve for um, complete access to your assets, um, custody of your assets, but yet be able to maintain um, operational controls and, and segregations of roles and responsibilities, giving the right level of permissions and having the additional checks and balances um, before anything is done within that wallet is what we spend all our time solving for. Uh, we've been solving for that since day one. Um, and we've done that with partnerships with um, over 11 custodians today. And so I think the thing that, that certainly sophisticated participants in Web3 understand is that um, all custody stacks are not the same. All modes of access to Web3 are, are not the same. Um, what what we provide on MetaMask Institutional is the ability to have multi-user access and control. Um, you are certainly using third-party custodians that have the regulatory licenses um, and jurisdictional coverage that you are required to maintain, but at the same time, you're in complete control of your assets 
Um, that third party fiduciary agent is not able to use those assets as collateral or rehypothecate it. Um, any, any activity within that portfolio is, is in complete control of the organization at all times. Um, and it's been, you know, something that has resonated with the market. Um, we built like that from day one. All our custodian partners have built for that from day one. And as we've seen all the volatility in the last, you know, months, it's been no surprise to us really, um, you know, in in such some of the price action, some of the volatility and some of the lack of access to assets. So the industry has been maturing quite significant right now. The, the blockchain industry is a multi-billion dollars industry where big players from Google to Amazon to Microsoft are all playing. Uh, but there's a lot of still myths around the industry, especially how this can actually work. And there's a lot of myths around centralized versus decentralized. Um, but in the end of the day, at least when I try to speak about this, is that in the end of the day, it's not different from replacing the biggest technology still alive that is probably paper into digital technology. So you want to highlight a bit on that because I think it's, I like to go to basics and, and streamline. Of course, you can go very technical, both you and me, but more important is to understand, let's say, if I'm a bank, uh, if I'm a, a an hedge fund, if I'm a um, even a government, how can I use this? Because it's a, it's a challenge that I'm facing every day, even with the, the governments that have actually uh, things going on, but they don't have a clue how to explain this in a simple way. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it, that's exactly that's exactly how we should be looking at it. You know, rather than trying to compare it to existing um, mental models, I think you are absolutely right when you say you, you sort of have to look at Web3 from a first principle um, basis. I love how you said paper, like the simplest thing is paper. And, and let's, let's move away from the whole dematerialized digital um, construct of value and come back to the basics of, I have a token, it has digital bearer qualities. It may be fungible, it may be non-fungible, but just like you have a paper certificate that might um, validate a certain condition of ownership, um, you need to be thinking about the, the token in, a, in the similar construct of this is a digital bearer asset that is able to convey digital scarcity and sometimes uniqueness. And then you take it from there, work backwards and saying, okay, how do I responsibly own this? How do I set up the governance policies to define what, how can this asset be transferred? How can this asset uh, be put up for sale? How can I um, use this asset to, uh, you know, borrow against? Or how can I uh, make this a productive asset? Like, what are the different things I can do now that I am an owner of this asset? And then working backwards, how do I ensure? So, so one is how do I um, how how do I make how do I go rich from owning this asset? And how do I make sure I don't lose <laughs> by owning this asset? If you think of it very at a high level, how do I do this as an organization? Then you begin to realize, okay, we, we need to look at this from a first principle basis of how do I track it? How do I monitor? How do I um, compliantly report the fact that I own this? And then how can I do all the weird and wonderful things uh, in Web3 now that I have this token that can travel uh, within this, this rapidly evolving world? And I think it's a good thing when you say, let's not try and um, force fit this with the existing financial market infrastructure, which was not built for a digital asset of um, with bearer quality. I think that's the fundamental difference where you, you will have digitization and automation without taking into account the bearer quality of assets. Uh, and and sometimes the unique quality of assets. 
No, completely. And I, and I think it, I like the way you put it. And, and that is actually the biggest challenge right now to take this to the markets and, and take it in the right ways. So one of the things that you have, especially when it comes to institutions, is areas like crypto funds, market makers, trading desks, and DAOs. So can you give a bit of an example of the ones that you've been probably having more traction uh, or the, any, any particular case study you want to highlight? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, I think overall, MetaMask Institutional um, has been approaching the solving for organizational access to Web3 in a, in a quite a radically different way to other sort of B2B participants in the ecosystem in that we are intentionally quite broad in the kind of customers that can um, find value on the platform. Um, that being said, I, I would like to highlight potentially two use cases. One is of a crypto fund or a DeFi fund. In, in the traditional world, unless you are a half a billion dollars in AUM, you typically do not have access to credit lines and um, and just services among vendors in the traditional space. Whereas you could be a $5 million AUM DeFi fund and you can get started. You can start to build a, a track record of your um, portfolio and, and you will have um, you know, open source as well as tools that are available out of the box in order to create a track record. So I see this technology being almost a great leveler in, in, in leveling the plane for professional portfolio managers to get started with um, enterprise grade tools um, with the access to leverage and liquidity the same way that a fund a thousand times bigger would have access to today. The second use case I would say is brands or um, sort of web two companies that are established brands among retail today. And they are quite forward. So the digitally forward thinking brands of today are actively exploring how um, NFTs as well as um, fungible tokens could be used in order to engage communities. There are existing communities that are today digitally native, but restricted to web two platforms will eventually cross over to web three modes of digital access. And the most forward thinking of brands are actively exploring ways to make sure that they meet their customers, the next generation of customers in web three. So I would say these are two very entirely different customer segments. Both are organizations, but at, at the end of the day, it both comes down to, well, how do we help them own the asset and put them to work in different ways in Web3? Fantastic case studies. So, so let's look right now in terms of uh, some blue sky thinking about what is your goal. So I know that you are right now partnershiping with big banks um, there's a, little, a lot of work in terms of Web3. Um, so I don't know if you want to, let's start first with Web3.0. So there's there's a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of discussion when it comes to the foundations of the Web3.0. So Tim Berners-Lee recently was not so pleasant to the blockchain industry, but I think it's partly because probably doesn't understand it, or at least he went through the wrong narrative. But uh, definitely a lot of the narratives around the web 3.0 is that we'll be having a foundation layer of um, blockchain technology for identity, for supply chain, for a lot of these things, which is where you guys coming as one of the biggest leading platforms, both consensus that is managing the MetaMask institutional. So I know that the consensus has a tradition of working with some of the biggest corporations in the world, uh, partnerships with Microsoft and a lot of us. But in terms of this part of the Web3, there's still a lot of narratives. First of all, what is Metaverse? Secondly, what even is the Web3 or Web3.0? Because even on that, there's not consensus. But in the end of the day, 
at least my narrative is always what saves um, work for people or what creates utility is what is going to become the, the mainstream. Um, normally, is the ones that create the best case studies that work with good UI, UX, and good solutions. So at the moment, the, the financial industry is going through a lot of challenges, both uh, geopolitical, uh, both as well um, technological, mostly. And at the same time, there's still a lot of people that are financially excluded. So it's a big question, but my question is more, how do you see the narrative of Web 3.0 and, uh, and as well um, metaverse narratives and the MetaMask uh, institutional in particular? Yeah, I think... Um... So it it becomes um you're right in that yes consensus has had a history of partnering with the largest of corporates as well as uh, governments in their exploration in uh, blockchain technology. I think we are we're at a stage right now where certainly like certain customer segments are are graduating from you know, pure experimentation to actually building out sustainable business lines in Web3. And so what I describe as Web3 builders, uh, to me, they are almost the new corporation. When you think about previous um, generations of industrialized growth, you think about how can we enable um, the Boeings of the world, the Toyotas and General Motors of the world as corporates to build out the technology to improve uh, human civilization's um, sort of efficiency and output in enabling them to build um, the technology that then lets human civilization be able to do things faster. And to me, in the next frontier, I look at Web3 builders as the same. How do we empower a decentralized application to be able to provide access to financial engineering at the grassroots level so that even an individual that doesn't have a bank account can lend and borrow the same way that a peer that has been KYC'd and has gone through all the checks and balances and, and has banks willing to provide them credit? So that to me is. Um, the great leveler of the technology, both at the retail level and the institutional level. As a company like Consensus that builds technology for both user access to this ecosystem, as well as developer access to this ecosystem, we think quite deeply about how can our products enable the next cohort of corporates in the world that today look like Web3 service builders or service providers. To me, they are the, the, the next frontier of corporates that will develop the platforms and tools that will impact uh, everyone at the global level. Yeah, well put. And I, I think that's the challenge as well, the next trillion dollars business model that will come. So um, I'm going through a couple of notes here that I have related with some of the things you said public. But uh, one of the, the, the challenge when we talk about decentralized finance or DeFi is that, uh, and this is, uh, I will quote you, um, a very unique challenge is that you don't know who, who your counterparty is in DeFi, but we have been built tools with the um, um, MetaMask Institutional that gives you the ability to screen a DeFi pool pre and post trade. So could you talk about this? Because I think this is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to traditional finance, decentralized finance, and as well, the maturity of this, because of course, we are in a world economy where actually close to 2 billion people are still excluded from the financial institutions. And a lot of these people come actually to the internet without going for traditional institutions, which happens already in a lot of emerging markets. Absolutely. So I think, yeah, there are two ways um, to be thinking about this. One is, you know, you've got this open um, sort of permissionless, innovative ecosystem where anyone can show up to participate. And that's great, right? Anyone that's excluded in traditional legacy systems can now sh show up um, and access same liquidity and leverage and financial engineering from day one. Now, when we think of it from a institution standpoint, 
they will stand up and say, well, I have certain rules that I need to follow. Um, I think there's some universally accepted rules around not being able to interact with certain counterparties, like, um, like sanctioned uh, individuals or individuals that may be associated with certain activities. Um, and so how do we counterbalance the permissionless um, innovation that's happening in DeFi, but then counterbalance that with organizations that need to be able to abide by certain rules around counterparty exposure. And we do this in, well, the, in, there are two ways we look at this. One is how can we screen for the transfers associated with every transaction, associated with a particular contract or a particular liquidity pool that you're about to interact with? And how can we give you information of the quality of those transfers for you to then have the information to empower yourselves to decide if whether to go ahead and interact with that pool or not? That, that, that is what Codify Compliance does today. Uh, it is essentially a know your transaction tool that works on a pre-trade basis, but can also work on an ongoing monitoring basis because you could have a position in a pool and the composition of the pool may change once you are you are you have already transacted. And so how do we facilitate that on a pre-trade and post-trade basis is what the tool does today. I think taking a step back, the broader issue is um, the one you talk about. How, how can we empower um, systems that are built in a scalable, scalable uh, way whereby um, we, we understand that KYC needs to be uh, adhered to by organizations. We understand that, um, that as you're going from, you know, maybe a, a centralized closed ecosystem to one that's highly decentralized how can we enable the tools to be able to establish identity, but in a scalable way that can transport across the tens of thousands of prot protocols that are being built? Today, if I go and, and prove my identity to a intermediary like a bank, I need to go and repeat that process with the next bank, which works if you have only five or six banks to deal with. But what happens now in this era of permissionless innovation where you have maybe tens and thousands of intermediaries that you could interact with, um, how can we build a system that is efficient uh, and, and inclusive for all to be able to participate in, um, but yet keeping into account the rules and regulations and, and the need to establish identity, um, investor suitability, and, and credentialed access, which is which is still you know, an evergreen area of, of discussion. You touch a very important area that is precisely, so how these institutions work and of course all the compliance, AML and, and KIC that we're touching on how this can be done with the um, with, uh, wallets and platforms like MetaMask and what MetaMask is working. So one of the things that I'm going to quote you again, this was actually an article of Cointelegraph that I really like is, um, one of the challenges is precisely risk management because it's one of the paradoxes that if I send, like say, five ten thousand dollars for my conventional bank, probably there will be a nightmare in some banks. They will open or close the money, and I have even closed partners that actually had their money stuck for months without even being able to, to touch it. And then I can send one million dollars for crypto very easily. So that's the innovation that is there that we forget sometimes. But the, the, your quote is, um, and this was in the need for a specific institutional offering that actually can work in help institutions uh, using retail platform to manage millions of dollars of digital assets. And your, question, uh, your quote was, it was shocking the kind of risk management we saw from institutions. They had millions of dollars of assets kept within their browser plugins or retail mask, the mask browser with a hard wallet, wallet and a spreadsheet. That was really how the earliest crypto funds were getting involved in the space. So this is about crypto funds, the contest of the quote. But of course, if you go to major banks, it's very easy to act them and they are being acted on a daily basis. And there's nothing wrong. It's just they have to work much more. But this innovation should be and can be much, much bigger. And that's where the innovation comes. So I'd like for you to touch this and what, you guys, what are you doing about this? 
Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And so it's, um, you know, the, the, this 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 ecosystem has evolved almost overnight. We saw unprecedented growth in 2020. And so you had traders that, you know, began to take advantage of some of the opportunities that came up in DeFi in the summer of 2020. And they began with exactly that, with a spreadsheet and, uh, and the MetaMask wallet. And the way we went about solving for this is uh, essentially creating a a DAP that gives you visibility into your exposure across different trade strategies, across different um, networks, across all your custodial accounts. And so the MetaMask institutional dashboard uh, through a series of APIs is able to provide you uh, real-time visibility into your portfolio in a way that the wallet doesn't out of the box. And so it does involve additional real estate in order to be able to track this, um, to be able to um, have access to the analytics around your historical performance, uh, history of transactions, um, and be able to also then um, you know, download that and use that for external consumption for reporting or audit purposes. So these are some of the additional features and functionalities we provide in the institutional version to facilitate. This is actually one of the biggest things uh, when it comes to the future iteration of, first of all, the Web 3.0, but as well, how we build a, a new kind of immersive internet. So I, I want to see how do you see the, especially the metaverse concept? I know that is a big question. and and But in the end of the day, at the moment, uh, I would say the next five years and it's already becoming um, a mass, a mainstream part is that the idea of kind of a, a metaverse enterprise system is being built, uh, especially when it comes to work um, and as well to finance in particular, for instance, the likes of MasterCard have invested billions of dollars precisely building right now patents and a lot of areas on these areas. So MetaMask has been kind of one of the innovators on this area and specific, specifically with NFTs and a lot of different things. So how are you looking at specific solutions for Web3, um, both from an institutional grade, but as well from the how we take this to mainstream? Because at the moment, we have, I think, only two major iterations of, of meta, 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 Metaverse. So in one end, we have uh, the, the central end kind of platforms and sandbox. And the other end, you have, you have Meta, which, of course, is... It's more about VR and about the ecosystem of Facebook, and he has a lot of uh, restraints. But as well, I think he might have a third variation, which is the one I'm more interested in, and I'm provoking you in a good way, is how you, how you build a bridge that actually can actually create a better uh, immersive experience of web, which we are already using, but that actually can be um, with all the, the pros that comes with identity, blockchain, and the, the basic of trust, and uh, especially um, transparency. Yeah, I think, you know, I would um, look to our customers that are active in this space to really lead the way. Um, Nike has already announced that they are using uh, our custodial partner, BitGo, um, using our integration with, with MMI to be exploring how they engage with their communities, um, you know, in the in, in NFT space. We are working with several providers that are working actively with, you know, the world's most renowned brands in how they are experimenting with both NFT technology as well as um, fungible token technology. Um, so I unfortunately can't give you specific names because most of these discussions are under NDA, but um what I can say is that the most forward thinking brands are actively in exploration and are various stages of um, pilots with a select cohort of customers to evaluate how they think about customer engagement. Um, and, you know, we'll, it, I think it's still very early to predict how their communities respond to these innovations, it's ultimately going to be driven by customer engagement. And, you know, I think it's going to be an iterative process of things that are launched. And then, you know, we'll wait to see how these communities, you know, um, respond 
uh, positively or may not. And then, you know, you learn from that and iterate and move on. So I agree with you. Like I did spend a couple of years looking at augmented reality and VR myself. Uh, I think there were constraints around the hardware and the physical experience of having a device on your head for, for a number of hours. Um, we are certainly seeing Web3 builders on our platform using MMI for their corporate account in VR headsets for hours in how they are experimenting with digital wearables for their communities. And at the same time, we're also working with publicly listed Fortune 50 brand names that are thinking about, well, you know, you're going to have a combination of digital ownership, identity, and access to financial products. You're not, no longer going to go to a bank in order to access finance. You're probably going to see a merge of the two. And so you have brands that are actively thinking about engagement along all these dimensions for their communities um, that ha has nothing to do with VR and AR. <laughs> so I think it's still early, but I'm extremely encouraged by the quality of names. Um, you know, some, we find ourselves in conversations with, um, with digital marketing experts that know everything about brand building and community engagement and of which we are, we know nothing. We're not brand experts at all, but we are here to talk about, well, how can we keep your digital assets safe? in Web3 in the most on-chain way that gives you the most control and operational uh, frameworks required. And so it's really interesting how these conversations go, where we're teaching them about wallet tech and infra related to Web3, and they're teaching us about community engagement and brand building. And I think we each have to um, you know, be able to understand the other side in order to uh, find a solution that ultimately works and is practical and is adopted by the masses. I think it's still early and, and there's a couple of iterations to go before we get there. Yeah, a lot of work, the continuous work. So I know that we, uh, we're passing one hour, but I have still one or two questions if you have time. So one of them is based on your paper. So you co-author tokenization assembling the building blocks of an institutional digital asset marketplace. So in the end of the day, this is probably the biggest thing in our times because tokenization or digital assets is everything. We are digitizing all the economy, ourselves as well, our health, everything. And then everything is about digital assets marketplace. But at the same time, the challenge is that uh, most of the marketplace, if I buy a, I don't know, a Louis Vuitton or a Hermes, um, probably I sometimes I don't know if I'll receive a, a really uh, authentic or not. And as well, if I'm buying, even sometimes you don't know if the digital, if the, for instance, one of the things that I know that you've been working in the past as well is about uh, real estate uh, projects. And I'm working a lot with real estate projects. And one of the things is, let's say, if you build a, an entire building of even a billion dollars or $100 million or less, you are creating a digital twin. But that digital twin, sometimes the, 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 the assets are, distributed in not one place so if you put the building as an nft or as a digital asset you can actually create a lot of things so on this paper if you want to just share with us some of the um, the summary because of course it's a quite complex paper but it touched the building blocks of our society and financial models yeah i think you um you've done a good job to summarize it already but i think um I think it, it it really yeah it's it's difficult to generalize. Um, we are seeing the top um, twenty portfolio allocators in the world that have massive distribution capabilities in the Web two space to distribute financial products. Um, look at tokenization as the next frontier of how they. Um, efficiently distribute financial products to um you know to their customer bases um i think we've seen early um early examples you know from 2016 and 17 of consortias that worked in a private permissioned consortia based uh, ecosystem to be able to prove the efficiencies in reconciliation operations post trade operations um to, to, you know um the, there's certainly 
the business case that's been established. The problem, however, um, in sort of the prior constructs was there were essentially two things that that I think collectively the industry was not comfortable around. And one was, will institutions be comfortable operating in the sort of the permissionless, non-private public blockchain space? And I think in 2017, the answer looked quite different to today, where you have banks and asset managers that are actively looking at distribution of financial products on public chains. The second assumption was, will customers be comfortable using self-custodial models, using a browser extension-based user experience to access financial products? And that's another thing that 2020 proved that customers are comfortable. You know, the, 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 the way to access Web3 through the browser extension has become almost the dominant design. And once a customer, be it an organization or an individual, is comfortable with that, um, it becomes very natural for them to use that type of user flow. And so I think this we are now seeing the next stage of evolution moving from private permissioned closed networks to one that is being built on public chains or layer twos. We've, we've seen um, enormous level of technological advancement around ZK technology to be able to solve for privacy, security, and scalability on public chains. And so it's just we're, we're in that second stage of institutional experimentation in how we think about building F, you know, financial market infrastructure using blockchain technology. So if I had to, to sort of step back and look at the last five years, 2017, 18 were dominated by private permissioned uh, experimentation. And now we're seeing the sort of next cycle where experimentation is happening across practically every asset class, real estate and other real world assets um, for sure. But virtually I, I've spoken with um, sort of fund managers and asset allocators that are active look, actively looking at tokenization across all kinds of asset classes because they understand that that's a technology that will be integral to how they think about the distribution of financial products. Well, that's a, that's a, a good way of looking at uh, a very, I would say, large topic that is influencing us all. So I want to thank you for, for this. I think probably as last uh, talk, so you do a lot of stuff. You are as well a mentor. And there's a lot of young people listening to us and a lot of institutions. So it would be the advice you give for people listening to us to find more information about MetaMask, about your work, about mentorship. Because I know that MetaMask is a huge ecosystem, 30 million users of the Wallet Plus, um, which is probably one of the biggest financial products in the world. But as well, there's a lot of work in terms of education, um, coaching, mentorship. So if you could uh, give a bit of final push on that direction. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think Consensus Academy is a great way to start. We've got a ton of educational materials for um, someone that is beginning uh, and, and wants to understand the fundamentals of the technology. So if you go to the Consensus website and look for Consensus Academy, there's a ton of free resources um, and then, and then, and, and, you know, sort of more substantive um, developer courses that you could enroll in to get started. Um, to find more information on MetaMask and MetaMask Institutional as a platform, if you go to our website, um, metamask.io slash institutions, you'll have all the up-to-date um, information. You can also um, leave us a note and, and somebody in my team will reach back out uh, within a couple of days. Uh, you could also email me directly. Um, I am happy to share. So MMI underscore sales at consensus.net is our email group that is monitored 24-7. So if you had direct questions, please feel free to email and ask us. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been a, an honor and a lot of things here. There's a lot of uh, fantastic material. We'll put all the links to the websites, to Liz and to 
all the different corporate uh, uh, relationships. I want to thank you. Keep a great work. And hopefully we go into 100 million users and a lot of case studies that can actually change the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.